Okay, so I'm going to cover all of these topics hopefully in the next half hour and we'll try to see if we can stay on time. So what do we, um, so you've had your kidney removed. Some of these were questions that were raised. So I'm going to try to cover these important topics. What's the best therapy after the kidney is removed to prevent the disease from coming back? So these were some of the questions that you had addressed about stage one, stage two, stage three. If after you've seen Dr. Son, he's removed the kidney, is the, what do we do next if we don't see anything visible by scans? Should the kidney be removed if somebody already has disease that spread to the lung? We are going to talk about that. What is the first, we have seven drugs. How do we pick the best drug when you come in for your first diagnosis? If that therapy fails, what is the next best second line therapy? When should high dose interleukin-2 be used? What about combinations? And then we'll touch a little bit about rare histology subtypes, and finally close up with what's new and upcoming. So the first to address about adjuvant, so that's what it's called. So it's very common in patients with breast cancer today to have their breast removed and have no evidence of disease and undergo treatment for six months with chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, and radiation. That's, is that common in kidney cancer? So we already heard that especially for patients who are at a higher risk for the disease coming back, such as T3 or T4, or patients who have lymph nodes that were removed, we know that these patients have a higher risk of the disease coming back. But to this date, no therapy has actually shown to be effective in preventing the disease from coming back. Because we have really not had good therapy up till 2005, people have tried using high-dose IL-2, and they gave it to half a group, and the other half were watched. And in fact, there was worse outcome to the patients who got therapy. So today, the standard of care is observation. But what do we have by way of trials? These are all the clinical trials today that's looking into this question about, is there any value added by giving a drug early on before the disease actually shows up? It makes sense intuitively, but have we proven that in clinical trials? So I have listed seven trials up here. It's not exhaustive, there's probably two more, but just so that you know, thousands of people, so this is the start date it started in 2004, and we have trials still continuing in 2013. In fact, we have a trial here at Stanford with another drug called Axitinib, which I don't even think here with Axitinib. So these are all looking at more than you can see large number of patients ranging anywhere from 300 to about 1,500 patients are being enrolled in these trials to answer this question. Yes. That's what I mean. So it's not all inclusive. There are a few that I want to say every drug that we currently have today for metastatic disease is being tested in this setting. So do I have any results to show to this date? So the first one is um, this trial called the Assure trial, which started in 2006. That's the first one where we actually have a readout. What was this trial? They took patients with Anybody who had stage one and higher, so stage one, stage two, stage three, but they shouldn't have any visible disease that was seen after the kidney was removed. Those patients were taken and were randomized to either a placebo for one year, sunitinib, or serafinib for one year. This was a blinded trial, and you'll hear more about all of these from Sujata when she talks about clinical trials. But I just wanted to give you a little bit about the readout. This is the first trial for which we have any results. All of the rest are ongoing. The, the patients may have all been accrued, but you have to wait so many years before you know whether there is a benefit or not. So here's the first trial, like I said, it's called the Assure trial. It took patients with non-metastatic kidney cancer, they underwent surgery, and then um, they were randomized to one of these three for a total of one year. 
After that, they were followed, and you want to see what happens to these three groups. So there is an independent group that evaluates these results, and here are the results. Unfortunately, this was a completely negative trial. So here is the disease-free survival, and here is the overall survival, and you can see all three arms are blended together, which means that there is absolutely no difference by either taking a placebo or taking one of these drugs for a total of one year. So what went wrong? Is it the drug? Is one year too short a period of time? Is patients with stage one, their risk, you heard from Dr. Son, they have a 90% cure rate. Did we take two patients with too low a risk to actually show that there was a benefit? So there are many questions that we continue to want answers uh, but, and we don't have those answers yet. So there's really value added to continue asking these questions. So to go back to your question, the current standard of care is after your kidney is removed, watching is what we know best outside of a clinical trial. So we continue to urge people to participate in a clinical trial, but we really don't have any um, information that early on just taking these medications help. So that's the first question in terms of adjuvant therapy. Now, how about kidney removal in stage four? So the scenario here would be that 30% of patients who I first described to you who already have disease in their lung or their uh, lymph nodes or bone, and that's the first time they know that they've been diagnosed with kidney cancer. Is there any value in removing the kidney? You don't do it in other disease. So if a woman has breast cancer and for the first time comes in with a tumor in her breast and already has disease in her liver, we are not focused in removing her breast. We focus on giving her systemic therapy because in some ways the tumor has already escaped. And what's the value in removing the primary? In kidney cancer, it's slightly different because throughout the last two decades, what we have learned is that removal of the primary, even in patients who have stage four disease, is beneficial. Why do, why do I say that? It's based on these uh, two trials, looking at not a large number of patients, but anywhere from 100 to 250 patients. One group just got immunotherapy with interferon, and the other group got surgery followed by immunotherapy. So these are all patients with stage four disease. And you can see that there is some value added to this group who had their kidney removed and then went on to having systemic therapy. So the standard of care really has remained that if somebody is physically fit and can tolerate a kidney removal, Kidney removal followed by systemic therapy was the standard for the last two decades. Now the question is, we have a lot of these drugs that are so good, right? We never had all of these before. So does that same dictum hold true today? So the one that I showed you before were with interferon, which we now know is not even used. Nobody gets interferon. How about with these new drugs? Will this uh, paradigm continue to hold true? Should we be removing the kidney in every patient who walks into the door with stage four disease? And I think identical to the interferon data, there is this trial called the Carmina study where they're going to take 576 patients with stage four disease, and they are going to be randomized to either kidney removal followed by sunitinib or just sunitinib alone. So this trial will give us definitive answer as to whether all patients with stage four disease should have their kidney removed first prior to starting on systemic therapy. The alternate trial is, okay, kidney should be removed, but what's the appropriate timing? Should I get my kidney removed first and then go through systemic therapy? Not all patients can get a robotic surgery like Dr. Son described. If you have an open surgery, there is a long recovery period. And if something has already spread to your lung, is it good for you to wait 12 weeks or six weeks, whatever it takes before your recovery to go on systemic therapy? So this trial uh, in Europe, 
Europe is asking the question that should we do drug therapy first and then give it a certain period of time and then do kidney removal or should we go with kidney removal followed by drug therapy? So these are all important questions. We don't have answers today, but we are continuing to explore these questions. So till you get these, yeah. That's okay, maybe you can write it down so that yeah, we can remember. Yeah. <laughs> so in the meantime, let me continue. So for patients, till we get the results of these randomized trials, how do we know the answers to such questions? This is a large international database where all of us are providing information about what we do in the clinic every day. And this is run with an international database from Canada and they have looked at 3,245 patients. And um, of those patients, 1,600, so finally the numbers came down to about 1,611 patients. 676 had no kidney removal, whereas 935 had their kidney removed. So now I'm going to show you some information about what was the outcome between these two groups of patients. And what they found was that actually in this, this is not prospective, meaning we already did this and now we are looking back. That has a lot of bias because I would not have picked, let's say somebody comes in in a wheelchair. I'm not going to offer that patient kidney removal. So already, because these have been done, this is somewhat a biased data, but this is what we have. So if you look at the group who actually had their kidney removal, in this international database, it seemed that the patients had a better outcome. Their median life expectancy was 21 months, compared to if you didn't have your kidney removed, was only about 9.5 months. So there are some hints that perhaps even today, if you can get your kidney removed, that would be a better outcome. However, not everybody had benefit, okay? So there were some risk factors that were looked at. What was the performance status? What was patient's hemoglobin? What was patient's calcium? Uh, what was the uh, platelet count? So these are all, we look at normal prognostic criteria, and if you had all six, any patient with four, five, or six risk factors, it appears that they didn't benefit from kidney removal. On the other hand, if you are completely fit and you had none of these risk factors, it appeared that doing a kidney removal, so this is no cytoreductive nephrectomy, and this is the group who had their kidney removal. And you can see that these are all showing that it's statistically significant. So it appears that not everybody needs their kidney removed, but there may be a certain group of patients who may benefit from having their kidney removed. What's our approach at Stanford? Again, we pick patients who are not at an urgent need for systemic therapy. So let's say there's just one or two uh, small lung metastases. That's a good patient to have their kidney removed first, get that out of the way, and then we can start with systemic therapy. Patients who have a good performance status, meaning that this disease is not bothering your everyday living activity to be functional. Patients who have no symptoms. We, in general, believe that liver and bone disease is more aggressive and needs systemic therapy first before kidney removal. And, you know, most patients have, if a large, like one of the scans that Dr. Son showed, if uh, you have a 13 centimeter tumor and a few millimeter spots in the lung, obviously it makes sense to get rid of the burden of the disease by having your kidney removed. So we don't, again, we pick and choose, and we hope that the results of the randomized trials will help us uh, make a decision better in the years to come. kidney cancer for 10 years. You can take the mic so that people can hear your question. Um, I've had kidney cancer for 10 years, and I've never taken any chemicals. So in my particular case, where um, I have had metastasis, but mine's very, very slow growing, would this be something that would be recommended to a trial? Um, 
obviously 10 years is a long time. You know, you have done so well without any therapy. To prove that therapy is going to add any benefit for you now would be tough to do because you have done so well without any uh, help. Mm -hmm. So I think um, this is exactly why we need clinical trials. The behavior of kidney cancer is so different in different individuals. The minute we see spots in the lung, we are not just jumping to therapy because there are patients like you who could do well without any treatment at all. And we would much prefer that you don't get the toxicity from any of the treatments and you're leading a great life without the help of these drugs. Okay, so moving on to what's the best first-line therapy? Um, oh, sorry. Again, I've listed all of these drugs. Should we be picking sunitinib, pazopinib, high-dose interleukin-2, temsirolimus, bevacizumab plus interferon? All of these combinations have been tested and have shown benefit in a patient with a new diagnosis of kidney cancer. Which one do we pick? How do we know what's the right drug for you? So some of the factors that aid in treatment, the way I think about in clinic when I'm seeing a patient is, we think about the patient characteristics. You know, how old is a patient? I tell patients it's like going to a restaurant and picking off a menu. You know, what's your food allergy? That's how you pick what you want. And I think we pick treatments similar to that. How, how much treatment can you tolerate? So uh, do you have diabetes? How about high blood pressure? So those are the patient characteristics. And then we look at the tumor characteristics. We know that a lot of these drugs today have been approved for clear cell kidney cancer. Does the same apply for non-clear cell? How about sarcomatoid histology? So there are things that we look at from the tumor characteristics to help us choose a therapy. And then finally, drug characteristics. What's the toxicity profile of the drug, and how will your body tolerate it? Yes. Uh, so what's your position on capillary I'm going to show you a slide at the end, so hold your thoughts on that one. So these are the things that we decide about how to pick. And again, you know, the two big classes that we have today are the VEGF inhibitors and the mTOR inhibitors. And we pick, we think a patient, a good VEGF can, candidate would be someone who has a good performance status because some of these drugs have more side effects. So you want to be starting off in a good position to be able to tolerate these medicines. And they have a much higher chance for tumor shrinkage. So do you have a need for rapid tumor shrinkage? Is, it, is, it, is the tumor there causing your breathing to be altered? Then we want to be acting more quickly. And then I already spoke about comorbidities. And then here are some of the non-clear, the mTOR inhibitors. We have some, uh, if somebody has diabetes, this is not a good class of drugs. So th there are different ways to think about it. So this is overall all of the, I told you that all of these are choices. Sunitinib, bevacizumab plus interferon, pazopinib, and temsirolimus. These are all choices, and these are the trials. You can see that this was compared to interferon and shown to be superior, okay? How much superior? The response tumor shrinkage was 50% compared to 12%. The likelihood of progression was 11 months with sunitinib versus five months with interferon. And then pazopinib was compared against placebo and again shown to be of benefit. So we have all of these choices. And to date, you know, maybe Dr. Gruber will help us in the future by in analyzing individual tumors to help us make better treatment choices. But this is what we have today, and we have some of the earlier slide that helps determine these decisions about which drug to pick. So. I had a question about the overall survival. So basically, looking at the last column, these are these things basically, sorry, each one of these uh, rows here, all five, they go on and range between giving you an extra five, three to five months, it looks like. Is that the right way to read this? Um, I think, so this is progression-free survival, and what that means is... I mean, overall, I'm looking at the last column. I'll tell you that, I'll come back oh, to I'm that sorry. in a second. So progression-free survival tells you that if you've been on the drug, how long is it likely to be of benefit? 
how long can you stay on it before the disease gets worse? That's what progression-free survival is. Overall survival ultimately is what we really care, right? We want people living longer from these drugs. The problem, the reason why these don't look that different is we have seven drugs now. So every one of these patients who went on this drug, for instance, Sutent, subsequently went on to receiving six other drugs. So it's, and including that patient who was on interferon, right? So remember, this trial looks at sunitinib versus interferon. The patient who progressed after interferon went on to getting sunitinib. So that's why the overall survival doesn't look that different. The FDA approved these drugs on the basis of progression-free survival, which was a lot more meaningful compared to overall survival. Did that answer your question? No, nope, not at all. Okay. <laughs> it's real simple. I go on and have a chance of either screwing with this stuff and getting 26 months and not screwing with it and get 21 months. That's the way I interpret that right now. Well, that's now. what I'm telling is Just, wrong. That's and the wrong, reason good. it's wrong is because the, the reason you only see five months difference is very tough. It's not meaningful because the benefit that this patient, the, the one who had 21 months, right, normally if they had not received any other drug and just got that interferon and died, would have been more like 11 months. Because of the availability of other drugs, that patient went on to getting a lot of other drugs, so it appears that the magnitude of benefit got shrunk down. But that's really not true because they received all of these other agents that were available. I guess I, I, I just, I, here's my question. Oh my I'm sorry. I have to determine whether or not to participate in this stuff, one. And I got a choice. I can go on and either not mess with it or I can do it. It's not what number do I look at to show me in general for the two trials how many more months it buys me overall total. Yeah. What is the what is it an OS a PFS a QPRP whatever what is the what is the month thing that shows me the answer to that question? Yeah, I think it depends on individual diseases and it depends on individual drugs. In this trial, you know, back in 2006, there wasn't a drug for kidney cancer. So that's why we were able to do a trial like this that looked at sunitinib versus interferon. And subsequently, people have gone on to receive a lot of drugs that have prolonged their lives. So I know in the, for the audience, it seems it's hard throughout as I'm going over the trials. Don't look at this number because that's very misleading. It doesn't mean that if you have kidney cancer today, you're only going to live 26 months. That's not at all what things are. We have patients who go from first line to second line to third line to fourth line, we still don't know the impact of overall survival of all of these existing drugs. I know based on a database that we have of close to 2,500 patients that a majority of our patients are living far longer than 26 months. So, But this is how the trial gets done. This is how the FDA and regulatory agencies look at these trials to help approve it. As a member of the audience, that number is of particular interest to me. Of course. So I think probably, I'm not speaking out of turn here, probably to most everybody else here too. So if you had a mechanism to present that, I think it'd really be appreciated sure. at some point. Maybe Sujata might talk about that in her talk too. Yes. Since interferon has never proven to be very effective, why do the studies always compare a particular drug with interferon? Because back in 2005, when we didn't have anything for kidney cancer, you have to compare with something, and interferon was what every patient coming into our door would get. So you have to compare with that standard. In fact, there was a lot of concern about this drug, pazopinib, being compared to placebo, which was challenging, you know, how can you give a patient just placebo? But at that point, there was no drug that was shown to be better. So when you don't have anything, you have to compare, like uh, the woman up in, the, in, who just said that she's been through 10 years without any drugs. So 
Placebo might not be a wrong thing for certain groups of patients, so that's how those trials are done. Today, we cannot compare with placebo because, especially for first line, because we know that there are five great drugs. It would be unethical for us to do a clinical trial comparing placebo, but 10 years ago, that wasn't the case. So uh, this trial then went on to asking the question, okay, there is sunitinib and there is pizopinib, which drug should I get? And this was a trial called the COMPARES trial, and it asked the question for somebody with new diagnosis of kidney cancer, should they be going on pizopinib or should they go on sunitinib? So this was a randomized trial, patients with new diagnosis of kidney cancer who had had no prior systemic therapy were randomized to either pizopinib or sunitinib. And what they were looking for here was not to show that one drug is superior to another drug. All they were showing is, is it no worse than the other drug, which might help us choose one drug or the other? What were the results? And you can see again here that it's not that different. So the trial was positive in that sense that you have a choice of either one of these drugs and both were about the same. So that's the next step telling us, now we are not comparing it to placebo, we are not comparing it to interferon, we are taking two good drugs and we are comparing one or the other to see if we can give either one. And this trial proved to us that whether you went on pazopinib or whether you went on sunitinib, the outcome was about the same. And uh, they looked at a variety of side effects. Yes. So that says that uh, twenty after thirty six months, three years, twenty percent, which is that where that level is right now, uh -huh. are progressive free, right? Yeah. Twenty percent of the patients. Uh, can still take so the drug. So continuing on the drug. Okay, yeah. that's what I want to understand. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. So that's the first line. So really your choice could be either to choose sunitinib or pizopinib. How about second line? What do we have for second line? And we have again, you know, if you had uh, let's say you had a drug called pizopinib, you could have chosen sunitinib or the other way around. Is high dose interleukin-2 an option now? How about temsirolimus, bevacizumab plus interferon, axitinib, serafinib, everolimus, which one to pick? And these are all choices that we have. Again, you have to go back to the first slide that I showed you about patient characteristics, disease characteristics, and the toxicity of the drug that helps us choose one drug or the other. But these are the, uh, we all go through um, a national comprehensive cancer network, puts out guidelines that helps practitioners choose one drug or the other. And for patients with second line, if you have had prior cytokines like interferon, you could get one of these drugs. If you have had a prior VEGF, like either sunitinib or pazopinib, you could get either axitinib or everolimus. When I say you could get, what does that mean? It means that we have level one evidence by way of clinical trials which have taken this exact group of patients and that's how they studied it and showed that there was a benefit for giving, let's say, axitinib after you've had sunitinib. There is evidence to show that you can give everolimus after having had sunitinib or pizopinib. And obviously, you know, we want to continue encouraging clinical trials. So here is the summary of the second line that there have been uh, two trials now, one showing that after you get sunitinib, if you had axitinib, it was marginally superior compared to serafinib. And these are the numbers. Again, these are tough 
as a patient sitting in the audience to sort of say, hey, am I only going to get five months on this drug? I think it's hard to apply that to you as an individual. These are good for us to prove benefit. And again, you know, I'm not a statistician, but I'm a clinician taking care of patients, and I know that patients get far more benefit than this, than just showing this five months that we have up here. How about high dose IL-2? Anybody uh, have, has had high dose IL-2? Okay, so there's just one, and the reason why there is just one in an audience like this is because it's a harsh therapy. It's remarkably tough to deliver this. What is high dose IL-2? It's, um, I'm sorry, my yellow doesn't light out too well. So high dose IL-2 is an immunotherapy, and it's probably the toughest treatment that we give today. What happens, patients get admitted to the hospital. They are in the hospital for one week. They get this medicine intravenously, and it causes havoc to your body. It really does. It makes your blood pressure drop down. You have fevers. You have chills. You have rigors. You're feeling terrible. Your mind is all altered. Your liver function is abnormal. I mean, every organ in your body gets messed up. And the way it gets messed up, it's really like a storm inside your body. It's like the worst flu of your life. And what we are really doing is stimulating your immune system for it to go and do the thing. It sounds really good, but you know it comes with such a high price that it was approved in 1992, and through the late 1990s, there were a lot of people who died from this therapy too. So over the years, we have become very selective about who we give this treatment to, and why do we do it? Because among all of the treatments that I'm going to show you today, this is actually the only one that results in a complete response, meaning there are patients who have disease that's gone to their lung, has gone to the liver, but 7% of patients can be cured by taking this treatment. That sounds really great because that's what we want all of our drugs to do. We want not just for the tumor to become smaller, but we want to get rid of it so that you never have to worry about this disease for the rest of your life. Unfortunately, all of the drugs we have today, while they are remarkable in prolonging lives and giving you benefit, we haven't seen any cures with that with the current drugs other than high dose interleukin-2. So it only happened in about 8% of patients. And how do we pick this 8%? Is there a great way for us to just say, if you're going to be in that 8%, then it's worthwhile going through all of the side effects. But to, di to this date, prospective trials have not helped us identify a biomarker or something in your tumor that helps us say, hey, you're going to be in that 8%. Just go through all of the side effects. It's worth it. So how do we pick? We really end up picking based on patients who are young, who are otherwise healthy, who have the ability to put up with these side effects. So how about combinations in kidney cancer? You have all of these seven drugs. Why can't you just combine two of this? Wouldn't it be better than just one? Unfortunately, we have tried that, and those results have all been negative to this date. Combining two of these drugs have just been so hard to do because of the side effects. So we've really not been successful that the current standard, there be negative trials, and the standard is to do these drugs sequentially. So taking two and mixing them together is no better than just giving each one after the other, and that remains the standard. Okay, and then I'm going to quickly talk about new agents and pathways. Watch out for this drug. This is a new drug called lenvatinib. So lenvatinib is in the class of TKIs and targeted drugs. And we now know that the reason why a drug becomes ineffective is because your body develops resistance to it. And resistance happens in a different pathway. And lenvatinib is a drug that blocks the VEGF and also blocks a pathway called FGF. And it's, the, it's this um, pathway that makes this drug successful in kidney cancer. So it's not yet FDA approved. 
it was just presented at our national meeting, and they took patients with kidney cancer who had had one prior therapy and were randomized to either this drug lenvatinib or everolimus, which is affinitor, or the combination of the two. And what they did show was that the uh, drug by itself and in combination was superior to everolimus by itself in all measures that we looked at. What were the measures? Progression-free survival, in objective tumor shrinkage, and in overall survival. So for the first time, we learned two things, that there's a possibility of a new drug, which is always exciting for our patients, so lenvatinib. Second, for the first time, we have shown that perhaps combining the two drugs might not be that uh, much of a stretch. For the first time, we might be able to combine everolimus with another drug and show superiority compared to either one of those alone. So this is probably going to go through a phase three, and it may be available in the next several years. Finally, I want to close in with the topic of immunotherapy. So the buzzword, in not just in kidney cancer, but in a lot of cancers today is immunotherapy with a pathway called checkpoint inhibitors or PD-1, PD-L-1 inhibitors. And I know it is on trial. There are many patients who are already on it, but it's not yet FDA approved for kidney cancer. We are very hopeful that um, this drug will become available perhaps at the end of this year. There was a large trial that took patients with kidney cancer who had had one prior therapy and were randomized to either this drug nivolumab or everolimus. And we have just had a press release that came out sometime two weeks ago showing that nivolumab was superior to everolimus. So that trial will be presented at a meeting, will be presented to the FDA, and hopefully by the end of this year or perhaps early next year, nivolumab will be added to the list of all of the drugs that we have for kidney cancer. So I want to talk, but there are other immunotherapy trials. I'm going to quickly um, wrap up because we're going a little bit uh, out of schedule to talk about non-clear cell kidney cancer. So that's a large, uh, it's about 25% of patients don't have clear cell and they have non-clear cell kidney cancer. What's the best drug for that group of patients? It's a small number of patients, so we don't, we haven't had dedicated trials just for that group of patients. In all of the earlier trials that I've showed you, there was a portion of patients who had non-clear cell. So for instance, in the Temsirolimus trial, which had close to 1,500 patients, 75 of them had non-clear cell histology. And these were the numbers that we showed that Temsirolimus was superior compared to interferon. Similarly, in the Everolimus trial, which included uh, close to 1,000 patients, 92 of them had non-clear cell. And again, it appeared that there was some benefit to Everolimus. So we never had a dedicated trial just for patients with non-clear cell. I'm going to show you this trial called the Aspen trial, which was the first trial that was just uh, presented last month at our national meeting, which asked this question for patients with non-clear cell subtypes, what's the best drug? So they took patients and randomized them either to a VEGF TKI, and in this they chose sunitinib, or is the mTOR pathway a better pathway? And they randomized patients to everolimus. And uh, these were the results. Overall, sunitinib was superior compared to everolimus in progression-free survival. And then they looked at various risk groups. If you were good risk, again, sunitinib had an overall progression-free survival of 14 months compared to 5.7 with everolimus. 
for patients with intermediate risk, again, sunitinib was better than everolimus. The one group that really benefited from the uh, everolimus were patients with chromophobe histology. Again, that's a very rare type. It happens less than 5% of the time. But you can see in that group for chromophobe, everolimus outperformed sunitinib. So what's my take for patients coming in with non-clear cell histology? I would give them a VEGF TKI, like either sunitinib or pizopinib. But for that patient who has chromophobe histology, I might be more uh, pushed towards starting them on everolimus rather than a TKI. I think I'm going to stop there and have some room for questions. Um. So my, uh, I have a couple questions. First is, so my wife was diagnosed with stage four um, in October and then had surgeries in December to remove her right kidney and then a, a mass in her neck. And so far the scans have been clear. I'm wondering if there has been, anything has shown that either sunitinib or pozatinib have been able to prevent a recurrence of the cancer? Um, so That's your question is slightly different from the trials that I showed you, where just kidney removal and then giving drug therapy without any evidence of disease. To this date, we haven't proven that yet. Your wife has one step higher question that you're asking, that she has her kidney removed, but she also had a lymph node removed. So it's already spread and it was stage four, but right now has no evidence of disease. Is there any benefit in giving a drug early now rather than waiting for something to show up? There is an ongoing trial that's asking that exact question, but we don't have any evidence or any data to support use of drug therapy in this situation. If a drug had completely no side effects, then we certainly would be willing. But right now, till we can prove that there is any benefit, we would hate to put her on a drug that might actually lower her quality of life without really any proof that it's going to be successful. So the whole question of uh, doing individual genetic testing on tumors is really uh, a very important topic, and we feel that the science hasn't really caught up with what we know. So Josh Gruber is going to be doing a talk on doing genomic testing and give you some examples, but I don't know what he's going to say, but I'll tell you our bottom line is we don't completely understand what to do with the results. And any time that happens, I think we are a little cautious about doing testing if you don't know what to do with the results. But I think we are in the process of learning a lot of information. Five years from now, if I were doing this talk, I might be saying something completely different, that we are now going to be doing personalized medicine for every patient based on their tumor. But today, I think it's really part of research, and we don't have an answer as yet. Do you, is there any research in regards to low-dose chemotherapy as opposed to um, full-on Doses like this, there are some people who co that's called metronomic. You know where you believe that small dosing in pulses is better than just keeping them on like this. Which drug to use? I don't know specifically about insulin, but many of these strategies are being done, but they haven't really proven to be successful as yet. Yeah. Uh, do you have any data on uh, the side effects which? Medication has uh, less side effects than others? Than others, you know, uh, they all have side effects. And the thing is, it's very different. We know that there are certain individuals might have 
uh, certain SNPs that predispose them to some side effects. So not everybody gets high blood pressure, not everybody gets diarrhea, not everybody gets mouth sores. What is it about a given individual that puts you at a higher risk? And we think that there are some differences, but that COMPARES trial that I showed you that looked at pazopinib versus sunitinib, the outcome was about the same, but the side effect profile was different between the two drugs. So overall, I think there are side effects, and the way we manage these are by dose reducing, giving you um, enough tools to be able to deal with the side effects. And there may be times when we even have to hold the drugs to help patients get through it. Um, my name is Ravi. Uh, I'm a data scientist and a statistician. I, uh, I work with the Johnson & Johnson like in uh, breast cancer research. Uh -huh. I'm curious if this uh, subjects that you are showing us the stats, is it available to us or is it Stanford proprietary that? Oh no, these are all public. This is uh, uh, already published information. You probably won't have access to the raw data for you to do your own analysis. Got but it. these are all you know, published. They are uh, on peer reviewed journals but you probably won't have access to going over the individual data for each of these patients. I'm just curious if I could be of any help or anything. Oh, thank you so much. I'm sure we can use your help. I'll come back to you in a second. You're next, okay. After that, yeah. Hi, um, so I noticed that some of the first line was also listed as a second line option, but not necessarily the other way around. So can you speak a little bit to why that is and how is that determined and can patients go through the sequence out of that, I guess, right. recommended sequence? Yeah, I mean, I think the level one data comes from clinical trials, but in practice, if we have six drugs and we have a patient in front of us, we are going to be going one drug after the next. So that's why the guidelines, if you go through NCC and guideline, each of these drugs are listed under first line. Each of these drugs are listed under second line. We know now that patients go beyond the second line. We have patients who have had the fifth line or the sixth line of treatment. And that goes to show that in kidney cancer, that you continue to have benefit from one drug after the other, and it doesn't mean that if you have had one, that shuts the door for you for others. Dennis, can you come here? You spoke about the, the trial uh, nivolumab versus tem temerolac. Everolimus. 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 Uh -huh, for, second line. for second line. There was a trial that you started last year, um, I think, nivolumab versus sunitinib. Sunitinib. Uh -huh. And right. I wondered, is Sujata going to talk about how that is progressing, or can you speak to? Um, those trials, so the first, the way the companies bring their drug to the forefront is they choose different strategies, right? So the makers of nivolumab took patients who have had one prior therapy and compared it with what was the current standard. So remember I told you in second line, you could do everolimus or you could do axitinib, and they chose to compare it to everolimus. And after having 850 patients enrolled in the trial, you need a certain amount of time to know what the difference is between the two groups. And that trial completed its enrollment almost a year ago, and now we have a readout which says that nivolumab is better. We don't know by how much, we don't have all of that information, and we'll get to know about it in the months to come. So nivolumab will get approved, but it will probably have a label that you can only use it in patients who have had one prior therapy. No, so that's the first thing. So, so as part of a clinical trial, how can we do better? So right now, the current trial is going to be taking nivolumab and combining it with another drug called 
Ipilumimab, which is another checkpoint inhibitor. It's approved in melanoma. So the combination of these two is being tested against our current first line, which is sunitinib. And that's an ongoing trial. It just opened, uh, I want to say, maybe four or five months ago, and it's enrolling very rapidly. So for our patients coming in for first line, that's the clinical trial that we have. It's randomized again, so we don't know if you'll get the immunotherapy arm, but it's a 50-50. You'll get treatment, and you'll get the best treatment we have today, which would be sunitinib or this immunotherapy arm. For example, uh, stem cell transplants or CART cell stuff, if you could give your opinion on that. Well, stem cell transplant has been done in the past. So we have had a now experience both at our own center here at Stanford, and uh, this was probably in the early 2000s where a lot of data came from the National Cancer Institute, where this was an extreme form of immunotherapy, right? It wasn't stem cell. It was actually allogeneic transplant. So you take somebody else's cell and you put it in your body and that um, recognition that you have something foreign in your body is what was going to work. But it was very toxic. Foreign was bad not just for the tumor cells, but it was bad for a lot of your normal cells. So people died from lung infection, people died a little bit like in, but at least interleukin-2 is not, it's not damaging your normal system. So one of the problems with current immunotherapy is, is there autoantibodies generated that can harm your own body? So we worry about pneumonitis, we worry about um, bowel issues, so these are all things. Now CAR-T is a very um, new immunotherapy that has shown promise in leukemias, and is showing promise in a lot of other blood disorders. The uh, uh, current trial is just about to start for solid tumors, like kidney cancer and other. We don't have it open at Stanford, but uh, it's just about to start. 